Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to PNSQC's uh, webinar today. Um, we're having the webinar today as a precursor to our end of the call for papers, call for abstracts uh, for our conference in October. And today we're lucky enough to have Robin Goldsmith, um, who's going to be talking about test cases. And if you notice from the title, you know, we don't need no stinking test cases. Um, Robin's going to talk about, uh, I don't know if they stink or not. Hi, Robin. How are you doing? I'm doing great. All right. Welcome. So why is it that uh, test cases stink? I, I didn't quite get that. Well, it, in a couple of slides, uh, it will become clear why, why this title is used. Oh, okay. All right. So just a few uh, minutes about uh, PNSQC. Um, forward the slide, Robin. Okay, yeah, so PNSQC, we've been around for a long time. Um, a little bit longer than I've been around. I'm only uh, 18. Um, our conferences, and, and Robin, you, you, you too, right? I'm 23. I'm, 23. I'm older than you. You're older than me. Yeah. Uh, we're a nonprofit, and uh, I'm a volunteer. Um, we're kind of a hybrid, what I call a hybrid professional conference because we do have uh, papers in the conference, which is kind of characteristic of an academic conference. Yet our speakers and papers are from industry. So that makes us quite unique. Um, people sharing their experiences uh, uh, in work and what they're doing. Um, usually people that are really um, in the field doing real stuff, hands-on, and it's great to be able to come to our conference and, and get some of that sharing in terms of knowledge from people's failures as ways, as well as successes. Okay, go ahead, Robin. Uh, my name is Phil Liu, board member, and as well as the program chair at PNSQC. Um, but today is really about Robin. So let's uh, let's move on, Robin, and talk about you a little bit. You can see Robin is a is a great guy, um, and he's uh, he does skydiving and snowboarding, and he's also a pilot. But maybe you could tell us a little bit more about yourself, Robin. So I, I think I think it's time for me to take over here. Oh, okay. okay because I'll let you take over. Okay. Okay. So because I will... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I go was ahead, Phil. Say, I'm just going to let the participants know that we are recording the session. Um, they can ask questions through the question panel or the chat panel, and we will forward the recording to you after we're done. So I'll let you take it away, Robin. Okay. So Phil has been known as the funny guy. And um, so this was Phil's attempt at humor. <laughs> and, uh, so. Uh, yeah. First of all, my company is called GoPro Management Incorporated, and we have absolutely no relation to the camera company. Uh, probably every couple of months, I get a call with somebody asking a, a camera question, and I have to, you know, tell them no. And um, yeah, you know, I'm not a skydiver or a snowboarder or a pilot or any of that stuff. Really? But, I uh, you were. Um, no, it, no, uh, no. Phil gets a good laugh there. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what I do try to do is, is help people get the right results right. And I do that from a couple of key perspectives. One is business analysis and requirements, so getting the right results defined, but the other is from the QA and testing, and that's making sure that the things are done right. I also do a bunch of other stuff. I'm not going to dwell on that. Here's a pack of lies about me. You're, you're welcome to uh, uh, dwell on that however much you want to. Um, couple of things to point out here that are relevant to uh, today's uh, presentation. 
I've been a member of two IEEE standards working groups. One of them that came up with the current revision for IEEE standard 829 for software test documentation. And the other uh, where we came up with, a, and that, that was just an update, but we came up with in uh, 2014, uh, I was with a group that came up with a total revision of IEEE standard 730 for software quality assurance. And uh, I'm pleased to say that um, to a considerable extent that revised standard was influenced by what, by what I call proactive software quality assurance. Okay. Um, I've written a book on requirements. I've got another one forthcoming. Uh, I acknowledge I've been saying that for a while. So. Now, to get back and uh, answer Phil's question about the, the word stinking, um, many of you are familiar with the phrase, we don't need no stinking badges. Okay. And that phrase uh, is associated with a, a very classic movie called The Treasure of Sierra Madre. Uh, in fact, the the Mexican bandito, Gold Hat, didn't say we don't need no stinking badges. Okay. You know, he said, badges, we got no badges. We don't need no badges. I don't have to show any stinking badges. But it's, you know, as so often happens, um, terminology phrases tend to get uh, distorted a bit. So the title of the talk is purely to to play on on this very famous phrase. Um, not trying to say that test cases stink. Although for some of us I'm sure that uh, that's perhaps more true than we'd like to know. So let me ask you and you you can uh, write anything about this in the Q&A if you want to. Uh, Phil's monitoring that, but I just you know, want to ask whether is getting enough effective test cases an issue for you? Okay. And because that's what we're really concerned about here. And so we want you to be able to understand some essentials of test cases and some keys for making them effective. And we have four keys for making them effective. We want you to understand how to gain the benefits of low overhead test cases, okay? And recognize that you no longer have to overlook so much that there are ways to being more effective to get a more complete set of test cases, especially the more important ones, okay, without incurring all of the overhead and, and busy work that uh, often is associated with test cases. Okay. And so my main objective today is to create some awareness. Awareness that there are some possibly different ways of perceiving and, and considering things than what some of us may be accustomed to. And that uh, uh, if you're interested in going further, uh, that's what I do. I work with folks uh, both in consulting and training to help them uh, apply these methods advantageously. So I think we would all agree that a test case is the basic work unit of testing. And the question is, what is a test case? So let me share with you an experience that I had. I was reading a testing book uh, by a very prominent testing author, 
And um, in this book, the author described a one-page form that uh, the author said uh, should be prepared for each test case. So this form had, you know, it was not the test case. It was information about the test case, an ID, version number, description, who was responsible, short title for it, cross-references, categorization, and so forth. And so I said to myself, that sounds like a lot of writing. And just seems like a lot of writing for a test case. And that maybe the author of this testing book meant something different by test case from what I mean by test case, because this just seemed like a huge amount of extra work. Uh, rather than confront the author in a rare showing of somewhat tact and display diplomacy, I, uh, I put together a little questionnaire. And I sent the questionnaire to about a dozen fellow testing consultants and instructors and authors, including the author of the book that, that described this one-page form. And I, I had, I don't know, half a dozen terms including test case. And I asked each of these people, each of these authorities to provide their definition of each of these terms. The one, the only one I was really super interested in was test case, but I, I embedded it with others. And I got answers back from most of the people, including the author of the book. And for all intents and purposes, every one of them said basically the same thing. He said, test case consists of inputs and or conditions and expected results. Some people elaborated on various aspects of expected results, like changes to stored data or changes to the environment, change to state. Some people mentioned conditions, some people didn't, but everybody pretty much had this same definition. And then some also listed things like preconditions, and some mention various procedural aspects, you know, set up an environment, and execution steps, and so forth. But everybody said inputs and or conditions and expected results. Okay. So I, now I said to myself, well, if everybody is defining this test case the same way, is it possible that there's still something else at play that's causing the author of that book to interpret differently from the way I interpret? And so I changed the survey. Okay, and by the way, you can read about this, uh, this article on this actually was picked as the top software quality tip of uh, 2010. So this is a few years back, but uh, this stuff hasn't really changed. So what I did was I put together an example. And so this is a pretty big example. Okay, and, and I, I said, you know, here, here are a, a test for entering an order for a customer. And we can look at that, I felt, in five different ways. And so we could say that this whole thing is one big test case. Or 
that it's seven test cases, that each place there's a B, and by the way, there's a second slide of this, which is why your numbers don't add up here. But you, I'll show you that second page in a second. Okay. But I'm saying everywhere there's a B, maybe that's what you mean by a test case. Or everywhere that there's a C, maybe that's what you mean by a test case, and there are 14 of those. Or everywhere that there's a D, the red D, and that's uh, there are 20 of those. Or everywhere there's this uh, blue uh, arrow uh, with an E, and there are 24 of those. And so I said, look, for this example, okay, tell me which is the test case. Is it level A, it's all one big test case? Is it level B, there are seven test cases? Is it level C, there are 14 test cases? Is it level D, there are 20 test cases? Or level E, there are 24. Now, what I would like you folks in the audience to do is to spend just a few seconds, really just like 15 seconds to look at this, and then type into the Q&A, um, A, B, C, D, or E. Pick one, okay. R type it in, make your decision, type it in, and then uh, Phil will uh, uh, tell us what, uh, what you all have said. Okay. And this really works best if everybody actually does this. So please look at this. And decide, is it A1, B7, C14, D20, or E24 test cases? Hmm. Okay. So are we seeing any responses, Phil? Yeah, we, got, we got a few here. Got some E's and D's, <laughs> C. <laughs> Okay. okay we'll we'll give be... another another couple of seconds okay. here. Yep. Everybody, come on in and take a look at these. Um, okay. And there there are a bunch of them in the chat window as well. Yeah, I see. I'm sure you could see the chat window. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, looks like everybody. There's kind of a broad spectrum here, Robin. So. Yeah. So we got A's, we got B's, C's, D's, and E's, right? <laughs> yeah, we got some in the chat in the question panel that A says, uh, Christine says A, and then Janelle says E. Right. So, I'll let so you, uh... okay. So the point is that forever, how or however many people we've got, there is absolutely no agreement. Yeah, okay. We've got people saying A, we've got people saying B, we've got people saying C, we've got people saying D, we've got people yeah. saying E. Okay. Yeah. Now, the important thing to realize is that any of those answers could be true. There's not one of them is right and the others are wrong. Okay. What matters is whether you and your colleagues are interpreting things the same way. And just as those of you who are listening to this from wherever you are in the world are, are coming up with you know, a complete range of answers, I suspect, I've certainly seen time and time again, that when you do this with your colleagues at work, that you get the same type of result. Now, what's the significance of that? This simple little term, test case, that we think is so clear, and we probably are all using the, essentially the same definition, we're interpreting it differently. 
And so when, um, let's see, so when Christine said, ah, uh, A is the test case, and Elise said E is the test case, you know, Christine says, gee, it's going to take an hour to do that. And Elise says, no, it'll take five minutes. Okay. You're using the same words and interpreting them differently. And it's not a definition because you're using similar, if not identical, definitions. Now, if that's happening, and it probably is, you should have an inkling as to one of the reasons why you're having trouble. Because people are not interpreting things the same way. So the starting point is to first use use this survey. Feel free to use this survey. Do it with your group to, first of all, level set, where are we now? And then use it to get agreement. Get agreement within your group. And if Christine's group says, hey, uh, a, this is all A level, that's a test case. As long as Christine's group says, Test cases are at the A level. It doesn't matter what uh, Elise's group says. They could all have consensus that it's at the E level. Doesn't matter from organization to organization. It's the same concept as an agile team's uh, uh, story points calculation. One team's story points don't count, translate to another team's story points. Okay, but the critical thing here is getting consensus within your group. Okay, now, a test case is inputs and or conditions and expected results, period. Whether or not the thing is written, whether or not it is in any specific format. So a lot of people, when they say something about test cases, including I don't need them, okay, <clears throat> okay, uh, you know, the it's very common that they're adding to that some additional aspects of their definition. And so a lot of people think that a test case has to be written, okay? And a lot of people think that it has to be written in a specific format, okay? So, and, and there are some comments, you know, uh, Joe said I'd call A an end-to-end -end test. Well, that, that's fine. The whole thing is an end-to-end -end test if, if you do all 7 or 24 or 14 or 20 of them, okay? And, um, Ian, I would suggest that the definitions are identical. It's the interpretations of the definitions that are similar, if not identical, that, are, that varies. Okay, and that's really not a critical issue here. Okay, the important thing is that test cases don't have to be written and they absolutely don't have to be written in any specific format. And much of the thinking and, and argument and concerns about test cases are based upon premises of, the, of them being written in a particular way. Now, writing has benefits. Okay. If you write things down, it helps you not forget. It helps you share things, helps you repeat and reuse things. You can review it. You can refine it. You can use it to guide your actions. You can use it to track what happened. So writing things down is a helpful thing. Okay. It aids with understanding and uh, sharing and so forth. There's nothing that says how it has to be written, what the format is, anything like that, okay? So a lot of people, a lot of testers and test organizations and your bosses and your boss's bosses, okay, think that a test case should have a lot of keystroke level procedure 
in it, embedded within the test case. And very often, the rationale for that is that all of that keystroke level detail is necessary to enable somebody with negligible knowledge and probably with negligible pay to execute that test and in fact to be able to execute it over and over again very precisely. Okay. So this is often the rationale that I hear from people about why they feel the test cases need to be uh, very extensive, very and loaded with keystroke level procedural detail. Okay. And I suspect that this may be familiar to some of you. Now, let me first of all point out that if you're really concerned about execution at low price, an automated test execution tool is by far the fastest, cheapest, and most reliable way to do that. An automated test execution tool can repeat that test identically forever and ever and ever, hallelujah. Okay. Now, there are some other considerations that I think you need to be attentive to. So, in order to create these uh, very uh, detailed uh, with keystroke level procedures embedded okay, um, tests, it takes a lot of high priced talent to create and especially to maintain those tests. So consider the trade-off. Think of yourself as probably the high-priced person who's spending a lot of time creating these cumbersome tests so that they can be executed by somebody who's inexpensive. Okay? And when phrased this way, maybe you'd want to rethink the economics of it. Now, one of the fundamental premises of the exploratory testing people is that the more time that you spend writing documents, the less time you have left for actually executing tests. And that is true. Okay. Ironically, the more time you spend writing these documents, that actually gets in the way of automating those tests. Okay. And what we tend not to realize is that we're creating a situation where we are relying on tests that absolutely don't reflect the way a real user would use the system. A real user would not guided by this keystroke level procedure. Real users have real work to do. And ironically, all of this effort is actually ending up creating tests that are virtually assured of finding the least amount of errors. Okay, so why do I say that? Well, some of you may know Kem Kaner, uh, uh, the author of the best-selling book on testing. And uh, Kim um, uh, reports that he, he's now a uh, professor. And uh, he re tells the story of doing an experiment where he had experienced testers and inexperienced testers test the same piece of software using the same test scripts. And what he found was that the experienced testers found two to three times as many errors as the inexperienced testers using the same test scripts. 
Now, I'm sure that you can all identify with this, okay? And, you know, why is it that experienced testers find so much more than inexperienced testers? Okay? What's happening there? Using the identical test scripts, curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. So, inexperienced testers when they are given a very specific script, execute the script exactly as it is. They don't find anything except what the script absolutely catches for them. Experienced testers look beyond the script. They ask, well, what if I try that? What's going on here? And so forth. But the point is, remember I said, you're assuring finding the least amount of errors? That script in the hands of inexperienced people is going to result in revealing the least amount of errors. Okay. Now, there are other issues with regard to exploratory testing. I can't get into all of them here. I encourage you to look at my test huddle, uh, unconventional wisdom uh, blog and uh, testhuddle.com uh, from Eurostar's uh, uh, website. Okay. But think about what's happening. Exploratory testing starts at the point that the code has been written. It's executing the code. It is something that absolutely occurs at the very tail end of the development process. Some of you may be familiar with the buzzword shift left. Exploratory testing by definition doesn't do anything left. It's entirely right. And the problem is that most errors occur in the design of the code before the code is written, and exploratory testing really doesn't get to finding or improving or helping the design. Okay. Now, I say write enough to be helpful. Don't write any more than is helpful, but don't write any less than, help, than is helpful. Exploratory tends to take it a little bit more and says don't bother writing anything at all because it's just diverting you from executing tests. And I think you'll find that effective testers do use exploratory testing, but as a supplementary technique, not as a primary test technique. Okay? And that if you use some of the low overhead approaches that we're going to be describing here, capture enough to be helpful, no more, no less, then if your exploratory testing finds things that your written stuff, written tests don't find, update your written test so that you're not relying on exploration and guessing every time you run, so that your test sets become continuously improving. So I mentioned we've got four keys to effective testing. One of them is define correctness independently of actual results. Correctness is expected results. Okay? Your expected results are your definition of correctness. If you have not identified your expected results, you run a test and get some actual results, there's a very, very high probability that you're going to assume that whatever the actual results are, are what the expected results should have been, if you haven't figured it out. Okay. If you don't identify, don't define your expected results. 
you run your tests, get actual results, and then go back and try and figure out what the expected results should have been, you're fooling yourself. You're going to come up with what the actual results are. Okay. So what that means is that the test really wasn't very effective. The way to make it effective is you need to define your expected results and you need to define them before you've seen the actual results. Otherwise, you tend to just fall into the trap of thinking that whatever the program did must be right. Oh, and by the way, you actually have to know what the right answer is. You have to define those expected results correctly. And then you actually have to compare your actual results to the expected results. Now, I don't know about you, but I have seen many, many testers define expected results, run a test, get actual results that turn out not to match the expected results, but they don't catch that because they're relying on the code to blow up to tell them there's a problem. Okay, So you actually have to compare it. Okay. And then the other thing for effective testing is to follow independent guidelines. So I'm sure you're all familiar with things falling through the cracks. Well, the secret to catching more of the stuff that otherwise falls through the cracks is to follow independent guidelines. Independent guidelines are things that exist for some other purpose that help you know what to test for. So consider, I'm sure you've all gone to the supermarket. Compare what happens if you go with a shopping list compared to when you go to the supermarket without a shopping list. Shopping list represents an independent guideline to help you know whether you've purchased the stuff you intended to purchase. Okay. When you go without a shopping list, you miss, you forget to buy stuff, and you end up buying all kinds of other junk that you don't need. That's why it's all stacked up at the uh, checkout counter. So here's a, a couple of examples. So let's say we've entered customer number one, two, three. The answer comes back John P. Jones, right or wrong? Hmm? Well, I suspect somebody is saying, well, we, we got to know what the expected results are. Oh, well, the expected result is Jones, comma, John P., period. Now, that's probably the same person. And without knowing the expected result, John P. Jones would look just fine to most people. But in fact, it's maybe the right person, but there's a format issue. We enter a new customer's name and address. Screen comes back with the fields cleared, ready for entry of the next uh, uh, customer's name and address, right or wrong. Okay. Well, once again, we got to know the expected results. It should say added. Okay. We buy 10 widgets for $14.99, right or wrong? Well, there's a pretty good chance that some of you are saying that's right, but you got to know the right answer, and there's also tax on that. Now, these are very simple errors that can be avoided considerably by making these four keys to effective testing more conscious. These are errors that experienced testers fall into. These are especially errors that inexperienced testers encounter. So a test case consists of inputs and or conditions and expected results. So the operator enters a customer number at location X, Expected results, system looks up the customer in the database and displays the customer name at location Y. Okay. Now, first of all, I would guess that many of you have test cases that look somewhat similar to this. You may have laid it out a little bit different, but uh, 
many of you probably have test cases that look like this. And if your test case is, is like this, what else do you need to perform the test? So anybody, you know, please enter in the Q&A and Phil, catch it for me. Okay, well, <clears throat> got curiosity is one, uh, one component that you need, uh, a database is another. I think those were answers for something else, but you actually need the customer number and the customer's name, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. You got to have the data. Well, if your testing is just being driven by what's called the specification, which describes the inputs and or conditions and expected results in words, then what do you do when you're running the test? You've got to interrupt your train of thought to go find some data values, okay? Uh, and Eric. every test becomes an exception, which increases the likelihood that you make mistakes. And it's possible that either you are the only one who can find this data, or maybe you need somebody else, all of which is going to interfere with the efficiency and effectiveness of your testing. So let's look at this in a different way. Okay. So we've got the specification in words, and then we actually have, actually have the actual data values. Okay. So inputs and expected results, input and expected results, and this could go on forever. Now, there are some advantages to separating the specification from the data values. Okay? And maybe some of you can uh, uh, anticipate that. They need to be linked to each other, but they don't need to be physically embedded. And a lot, a lot of people think the test cases have to have the data values embedded. And that really isn't the case. So when the data values are identified, but kept in a more accessible format, what does that do? That facilitates, for instance, putting them into a table or a database. Okay. And uh, in terms of reuse, the specification probably can be reused for many, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. The specification can probably be reused for many, many combinations of inputs and expected results. And in turn, some of those test case values also might be reused. Some of them maybe have short lives. Okay. Now, notice this is a low overhead format. There's no procedure specified. If you need to define the procedure, define it once and don't embed it in the executable test case and don't have to keep repeating it. Okay. Here's another format, common format that many of us use, a script. Okay. So what's the deal in a script? It's a, a sequence of inputs and expected results. Okay. Now, this could be considered as a single big test case, okay? or, or rather as, as six simple test cases, or a single um, complex test case. The whole thing could be thought of as a test case. Once again, it doesn't matter as long as everybody uses the same terminology with the same interpretations. Once again, this is a low overhead format. This is the minimal information that you need in order to carry out a test. Okay? Or you can use a matrix format. Okay? Now, the matrix format, uh, by the way, the, the script format is good for showing navigation, but it gets cumbersome when you've got a lot of uh, uh, values, especially negative values for the same set of variables. A matrix, okay, 
We have a column for each data field. We could have multiple columns for the expected results. And then each row represents a separate test case. And there's a value for each of those fields. Now, the matrix, there are two important rules. One is that in order to um, be more economical, more efficient, we tend to want to combine conditions. So the rule regarding combining conditions says that if it's a positive or valid test, you can combine conditions for each of the respected fields so long as they all produce the same valid result. However, for an invalid or negative test, like number two, the rule is exactly opposite, because now we want one and only one field to cause it to go negative. Okay. If more than one thing could cause it to go negative, then the test lacks sensitivity, and we have no way to know what we have really tested. Okay. Once again, low overhead no procedure okay now think about the way that a lot of people go about testing okay you're given a you're given a situation to test you go out and you start creating test cases and then you analyze and prioritize the risks they address and you run the higher risk ones okay and i suspect that that's very similar for many of you so Let's say that you've created 100 test cases, you have time to run 10 of them. Well, what are you gonna run? You're gonna run the top 10, the, the highest risk ones. Now, given that, what value did we get from the time we spent writing the 90 tests that we didn't have time to run? Okay, none. Okay, we didn't really get value there, okay? And what about all the other tests that we didn't even think of? Where did they go? Okay. And what are the chances that the 100 test cases that we have identified were testing the most important things, let alone the 10 that we settle on? Okay. So, the good chance that we end up relying on relatively inefficient ways of identifying test cases and quite possibly overlooking some. So I mentioned that I was a member of the uh, uh, working group that came up with the 2008 revision uh, to IEEE standard 829. I'll just acknowledge it's a controversial standard because it's frequently interpreted as mandating lots of documentation for its own sake. I think that's a misinterpretation. And I think that you should and can view the standard as a way to help you organize your thinking, a way to write just enough to be helpful, no more but no less. And I think that when you use this approach, that it enhances Agile without adding excess effort. Now, the, I, uh, the standard revision that uh, we came up with in 2008, uh, two of our objectives were to make it easier to read, add some diagrams, and to uh, try to counter this perception that it was mandating lots of documentation for its own sake. I think that we made some progress on the readability, not so much on the uh, documentation. So let me show you a diagram. Now this is my diagram, this is not in the standard. And this phrase, what must we demonstrate to be confident it works, is my phrase. Okay? It's not in the standard, but I think you'll find that it is faithful to the standard and that in fact, it is the essence of what testing is about. And that if you do nothing else besides ask this question when you're trying to figure out what to test, that your testing is going to become more effective and efficient. 
So the standard describes four levels of test planning and design documents. The master test plan is the project plan for the testing project. And testing is a sub-project within the overall development project. And when we ask what must we demonstrate to be confident it works, what we must demonstrate is a set of what are called detailed test plans, okay? So the master test plan is a project plan. Detailed test plans are project plans for sub-projects within the, the overall testing, for unit tests, and integration tests, system tests, Robin, and so forth. Robin, if I could interrupt you for a second. Um, in Agile, we don't have time for no stinking uh, test plans. Okay. Now, have I said to write anything yet? No, but... This what did we say? We said <laughs> this is a way to organize your thinking. Okay. Okay. And yeah. thinking is something that Agile theoretically advocates. Okay. That sometimes is questionable. Okay. So you've, you've got in your head, when I say test plan, you've got in your head a, a thousand page document that nobody wants to read. Not I'm saying use this as a way to organize your thinking okay so the master test plan is your overall approach okay detailed test plans are how the project plan for testing smaller sub projects within your project that might be for your sprint for instance okay or maybe maybe that's still bigger okay but the detailed test plans are dealing with a smaller, smaller body of information. For each of those, we could ask, what do we need to demonstrate to be confident it works? And for each detailed test plan, there is a set of features, functions, or capabilities that if they all work, would cause us to say that that unit test or integration test or whatever works, okay? Now, for each of those, we have what is called a test design specification. And for each test design specification, we could ask what must we demonstrate to be confident it works? And what we demonstrate to be confident that a test design specification works is a set of test cases, executable inputs and or conditions and expected results. Okay, and then there are related procedures and reports. Now, the structure, the thought structure has advantages. Some of these pertain to both reactive, traditional testing, and also what I call proactive testing. Some of these are only going to pertain to proactive testing. So, one of the fundamental concepts of project management and agile is that big things are complex and risky and that you reduce risk by breaking big things into smaller, more manageable pieces. That's what a sprint is, okay? That's what your backlog items are. So what we've got here is a structured way to approach it. Now, you pick the size view for the size of your need. So if you're dealing with a big piece of functionality, you may need a detailed test plan, okay? If you're dealing with a feature function or capability, you maybe only need the thinking at the test design level. Robin, okay? just, a, and, just a quick yeah. note, we have five minutes, so we have a lot of questions that have come in, so. Um, well, let me, let me, get through here so that uh, people have a little bit more information, okay? So, the structure helps you organize and manage your test cases. It helps you recreate them, okay? And those are true, those things are true whether we're being reactive or proactive, okay? There are also things that are only pertinent to proactive testing. Proactive testing, okay, what, what happens is that we use special techniques that help us identify more of the conditions than we ordinarily identify, okay? 
And when we identify more of those conditions, that enables us to be more relevant and more meaningful in our prioritization. Now, the other big difference about proactive testing is that unlike traditional testing, which starts with test cases, which are small risks, we start with the large detailed test plan size risks. Those are the ones that turn into showstoppers when they're missed, okay? And so we use techniques to spot more of them. We analyze and prioritize based on risk. The ones that are the highest risk, the big risks, those are the ones we're gonna test more thoroughly, but because we're being proactive, we can also test them earlier. And that's not possible in reactive testing because reactive testing comes at the end. Then for those large risks that we're focusing on, we use similar approaches to zero in on the higher risk uh, uh, and, and identify more of the conditions for medium-sized risks, which are represented by test design specifications. And then for those that we're zeroing in on further, then we use a special approaches to identify more of the small risks that are represented by test cases. Okay, And the net effect is that we're able to direct our attention to more important stuff okay, so that we're not uh, frittering away some of our time. Okay, Now, proactive testing also facilitates reuse. Now, there is reuse of two things. Reuse of test cases, as in regression testing, which is true for both proactive and reactive testing, but also reuse of test design specifications. Okay? And that's something that proactive testing can do and gets a lot of leverage because a test design specification controls a set of test cases. So let's say that a test design specification pertains to 20 test cases. It's just a lot more efficient to reuse that single test design specification and drag along with it automatically its 20 test cases than to try to reuse the 20 individual test cases. Okay. So test design specifications are in a one-to-many relationship with test cases. Test procedures are in a one-to-many relationship with test cases. So I know that uh, we've covered an awful lot of information there, okay? But test case essentials, inputs and or conditions and expected results. Doesn't have to be written, doesn't have to be written in any particular format. The four keys to effective testing, you know, you need to define expected results correctly. Okay. Test cases do not have to be high overhead. They can be low overhead. That's the minimum. You've got to know what your inputs and expected results are regardless. And if you rely on memory and guessing, you're fooling yourself. Okay. And when we use some of these additional concepts to look at the big issues, the large risks that are so often overlooked, and how do we know that? Because they're, when they're overlooked, they turn into showstoppers, okay? You don't have to overlook so many of them, okay? So this is a start. If you're interested in uh, finding out more, okay, I present uh, training both in public and uh, in-house, uh, online and on site, okay, including proactive <laughs> testing, risk-based planning, design, and management. So, Phil, well, you've got a lot of questions, and you're going to sell everybody here a seat at PNSQC. Turn. It's my turn. Okay, so I got you know quite a few things. You know, first of all, I was um, I was rather insulted when you said that myself being a load-paid person that I need lots of detailed steps to execute a test case. And, you know, even though I don't make a lot of money, I don't need a lot of steps. And I think that's really an assumption that people need lots of detailed steps to do test cases. Maybe we just need to rethink that, that type of 
Um, well, I I agree with you. I don't. I I think first of all that it's ridiculous for high-priced people to spend a lot of time and effort creating tests so that low-priced well, people can execute them. Yeah, and I think that the level of detail that's needed, or the level of granularity and steps and procedures, as you said, really depends on. Um, not only the skill of the people that you have, but a lot of other factors like turnover. You know, if you have turnover in your staff, um, then sometimes it's good that, you know, you have test cases with a little bit more detail because you've got new folks coming in and they need to get up to speed and, and make a contribution. And sometimes if you have a very high level test case, they won't be able to get it done. Okay, so, so I'm going to suggest to you that it is far more appropriate and far more efficient and far more effective to spend your effort training your tester yeah. to act and think like real users sure. rather than trying to channel them very narrowly so that those tests only reveal what's on the, the face of the test. Sure. Um. So we got a couple things, you know, Ian, a lot of folks had mentioned that in terms of when you're, when you're checking the output that the, the format of the output and the UX uh, of the output is also part of something that a tester should check for. And uh, I'd have to That's true. agree with that. Um, That's true. And that, that is part of correctness. Yeah. It's part yeah. of expected results. Ian, uh, one of the one of the attendees had mentioned that the value of test cases, of written test cases, goes down because upon their first execution, that they may find a problem, and then after that, you know, the problem is fixed, and then of course, then the test case has no value or less value. Um, but you know, I guess it has value in regression and making sure that problems don't come back. That's for sure. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. and if you don't if you don't have that test identified in some way that you can repeat it, um, you're not going to be able to do meaningful regression testing. Right, and then the other thing, um, a comment was, and, uh, and 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 so Christine just said a good reason to automate regression tests, and I I yeah. think I said that the yeah. first thing, and by the way capturing that information in an automated form okay, is still a form of writing. Right. And um, then uh, Ian has a question on uh, that I'm not, I don't quite understand, but uh, it has to do with uh, the red green refactor and how it compares with this, with the after the fact test and execution. Um, do you know what that is? Did you have some red green slides on your? I didn't. Um, so red green usually is a, uh, an indicator from an automated test tool. Okay. I assume that's what he's referring to. Okay. okay. Now the fact is that if something has been refactored, um, indeed that test may need to be modified uh, to reflect whatever change the refactoring did, okay. but you still should end up with the, you know, your definition of correctness and and uh, uh, you know capturing the actual results and making sure that they in fact are correct. Yeah. Uh, one last comment was that you know when you showed your your standard stuff with eight twenty nine and you know, having a testing projects, so to speak, is there ways that we can move the project to the left and, and have it a story by story rather than, you know, have a big project, so to speak? Does the project actually happen during development and developing the stories one at a time or the test for each story one at a time? Um, it, it looks a little bit sequential, um, well, it's not. Okay. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. Okay. So, if you've got a story that might be comparable to a medium-sized risk, which is what a test design specification captures. 
That is, you're going to have a set of test cases that together give you confidence that that story uh, has been uh, implemented effectively. Some okay. of those might be test first unit tests. Some of those might be user story acceptance tests. Some yeah. of them might be others. Okay. okay. But the point is that you use the appropriate size thing based upon your need. Okay. okay? And one of the, one of the Agile's well recognized uh, limitations is that Agile tends to look at very small pieces and then sometimes loses sight of integrations and mm. so forth. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay. okay. Well, and this is all just capture your thinking. Look at the big stuff, yeah. then look at the medium sized stuff, then look at the small stuff. I think Rather than starting with the small stuff, which is very likely to cause you to overlook some of the bigger stuff. Yeah, I think uh, one of the takeaways I've got, at least from this, Robin, is that all these plans that come in this documentation standard, um, they could just be in your mind or in your team. Exactly. It, it, it's it think of it, think about it, write it, write it down so you don't forget it. Right. Write it down so it's clear to you and so yeah. forth. Okay. okay. But, it, could, uh, but it doesn't mean that it has to be a thousand page document. Sure. sure. Let's go on to the last page here, and I'll just want to remind our um, attendees, thanks for attending. Um, we did open our call for papers for the conference on, July, on January 25th, which is one of the earliest days that we've ever done before. And the call for papers closes on April 17th. So please, um, you know, we're going to have a great conference this year. We've gotten already uh, pretty much a record number of submissions, but it would be great to hear from you and your abstract submissions um, up to April 17th. And we look forward to seeing you at the conference in October. So thanks very much, Robin, and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay, thank you all, and um, everybody go to PNSQC. <laughs> okay, Rob. thanks, bye. Okay, bye now.